their laptops and cell phones offline. Um, and also, please don't forget to give me back the paper within three minutes from now. Uh, it's again a pleasure and an honor to introduce Kota Murase, Professor Kota Murase. Kota has been a student at Kyoto University where he got his PhD. Then he moved uh, for uh, two postdocs, two long postdocs in the United States. He went to Hoya State and then he went to the IAS at Princeton and then he became a tenure track professor at Penn State, where he is now, and he's also an associate professor at the University of Kyoto. And uh, he's going to be telling us other interesting things, slightly different from what we heard in the morning, but definitely related to. Thank you very much for coming, Kota. It's really an honor to introduce you. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. OK, so the, today, is, uh, basically, I'm going to focus on the more astrophysical side, and uh, you know, Pascal has uh, already talked about the cosmic ray acceleration and propagation. Then maybe uh, some of you might be interested in the applications of the, these physics. And then especially, I'm going to uh, focus on the multi-messenger transients in gamma ray burst, supernova, uh, some related transients. This is a kind of hot topic in view of the gravitational wave and uh, neutrinos. So OK. So today, probably the, my lectures are consist of two parts. One is a gamma burst and a related transient, and the other is high energy neutrino astrophysics. I, I think to, today, the, probably we can only focus on the gamma ray burst overview and the prompt emissions. Then probably tomorrow, the, I'm going to talk about afterglow uh, some GRB supernova connection. OK, so now, so as everybody knows, uh, this is the era of the multi-messenger astroparticle physics, astrophysics. And now we have uh, you know, the measurement with four messengers and neutrinos, and uh, gamma rays, and the cosmic rays, and the gravitational waves. So just a, a brief refresh, uh, you know, what happened in the recent years. So the, about a couple of years ago, probably six years ago, so there, there's a big discovery, and then the ice cube um, uh, measures, uh, detected the neutrinos from the, uh, some extra uh, terrestrial space. And then the, basically, the, okay, they found the neutrinos with PB energies, 10 to 15 electron volt. And then this is a kind of ghost particle. The interaction is very weak, and then the weak interaction is much, much weaker than the electromagnetic force. And then uh, this is the kind of the dawn of the high energy neutrino astrophysics. Then, three years ago, so the LIGO, advanced LIGO, uh, detected the gravitational waves uh, using the, you know, the interferometer technique. And then, yes, gravitational waves are predicted in the general relativity. In the general relativity and uh, this is just tiny, tiny distortion in the space time. But uh, you know the, it's very weak, and uh, basically the, you know it's very apparently it seems very difficult to find because the distortion is on one over ten thousand of the atomic size for the entire Earth. But uh, you know the but based on because of the you know the you know develop, development progress in the experimental techniques, then using the you know the microsomorphic you know the uh, interferometer, then basically the uh, they can detect uh, such a tiny, tiny distortions. And of course, still, you know, such a gravitational wave can be produced only by the, you know, very extreme objects such as black hole mergers or neutron star mergers. And then the next year, and then the one more, you know, the significant discovery. So the, uh, you know, the advanced LIGO detected the, a gravitational wave of the neutron star mergers. Then, yes, so the, after the, the, the important is, yes, the, not only the gravitational wave signals, but also the gamma ray burst also detected by Fermi. And then just, you know, the two seconds later, about two seconds later, and the basically gravitational waves, you know, the found, and the gamma ray burst, you know, also found, and then, then the people try to look for the, you know, the uh, counterparts, and then eventually, the, you know, the, uh, ten, uh, about you know, the t 10 to 11 hours later, the optical telescope found the counterpart. Then this is the kind of the, you know, actually this was turned out to be the consistent with the theoretical prediction, and then plus, 
even, you know, the, of course, uh, other, you know, telescopes try to uh, continue the observations. They also found the counterparts in the X-rays and the radios. And then uh, these are kind of the all consistent with the theoretical model. And then uh, in this case, uh, we had, uh, you know, the concordance pictures of the neutron star mergers and the uh, kilonova macronova emissions, which is expecting the optical to infrared, plus, uh, you know, the extra radio afterglow emissions, which uh, come from the jet. Then one more. So the, this is actually the ice cube event in the so-called 170922A. And, uh, you know, the, this gravitational wave, you know, was discovered in the, this is the 170817. So just one month, about one month later, then ice cube actually detected a very high energy neutrino event. The net neutrino energy is order of 300 TeV to 1 PB or something like that. And then, okay, it's the same game. Oh, the neutrinos came, then they tried to make uh, follow-up observations, and then they eventually they found that, you know, the uh, blazer, which is flaring in gamma rays, and the press, the people who make uh, follow-up observations in the X-rays and the radios, yes, the radio opticals, the uh, ultraviolet, you know, they also, you know, sh uh, show the flares. So, in this case, a coincidence is only three sigma, but uh, this is a kind of a demonstrates the success of the multi-messenger observations triggered by the neutrinos. Just you know, coming in the neutrinos and they try to make a follow-up observation, they found a flare. At least you know, the, this kind of the strategy works. Okay, so the, uh, just you know, we have threes. Now, you know, I would say that you know, the, yeah, this blazer stuff, and the black hole, actually, the, even the black hole matches, actually, the, uh, some people found the, you know, the gamma ray right, counterparts. Then these two things are coincidence are kind of the, under debate. So we are not confident. However, at least, uh, you know, for the neutron star merger case, so the, we have concordant pictures, and then uh, we, you know, we are sure that, you know, the neutron star gravitational wave signal is kind of related, physically related to the, optical and uh, X-ray radio counterparts. Okay, so the multi messenger transient, so that we have a gamma ray burst and a supernovae, and uh, as you know, the supernova actually is uh, already known to be a multi messenger transient, because in uh, 1987A, we, you know, the, we detected the neutrinos in the coming candy 2 in 1987. So the, you know, so the basically the, you know, we actually the, uh, confirmed that, you know, the supernova neutrinos uh, come from the uh, gravitational curves. And plus uh, we have, you know, gamma ray burst. And then in the case of the gamma ray burst, uh, we have a some, you know, consistent picture between the gamma ray burst and neutral star mergers. So neutrinos gravitational waves are, are, are very important to probe the physics deep inside the, such a dense environment because they can penetrate, uh, you know, even the dense environment. So in a sense, if you can use, uh, you know, these new signals, neutrinos, gamma, uh, gravitational waves, in principle, that we can uh, probe the, what is going on, and uh, even if we cannot see in the electromagnetic waves. So, and then another thing that importantly is that in the case of gamma ray burst, as we explain, as I explained, uh, many things are known. So that if we can see the neutrinos gravitational waves, in principle, that we can understand the, what's going on. Okay, the gamma ray burst. So gamma ray burst, uh, kind of the brightest uh, explosive phenomena, astrophysical phenomena, and in the universe. So the luminosity is actually tens of 51 eric per second. In uh, you know, 10 to 100 seconds, or even one second. So the basically, the, you know, just one event outshines the, you know, the luminosity of the whole, you know, so the flux of the whole galaxy, you know, in the short time. So the, uh, we believe that they come from the jet, relativistic jet. And then uh, we, as the, I explained, that there are two types of the gamma ray burst. One, is, one type of the gamma ray burst, long gamma ray burst, which are believed to come from the death of massive stars, but uh, the other type of the gamma ray burst, the short gamma ray burst, uh, hmm, it's weird. Okay, so they come from the compact object, uh, the neutron star, neutron star mergers. 
So the, when the gamma ray burst discovered, actually many, many years ago, actually the, this was a satellite, so-called Vera satellite. So this was a launch to watch the uh, nuclear test. <laughs> so it was secret. So that when it was discovered in 1967, uh, of course it was secret, then people didn't know, the many people didn't know that. The, the later, of course, uh, some people actually, the, I, I think that some people guess that it might, may be produced by the aliens or something like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, of course, it's not true. And, uh, yeah, eventually, at least, uh, you know, uh, it's not the nuclear uh, results of the nuclear weapons, and then not the aliens. And then eventually, the people uh, recognize that this comes from space. And, you know, this is a kind of fast gamma ray burst right curve. And this was announced in the 1973. Then after discovery, the announcement, and the people started, started to debate what's the, what is the origin. Then this is the actual big question. The, actually, the, at that time, the number of steroids, and of course, uh, you know, uh, initial, you know, in the very beginning, the number of steroids is more than the number of the GRBs which were discovered. <laughs> so, so lot of discussion there. Then, one of the fundamental question is that gamma ray burst happening, whether gamma ray burst happening in the galactic or exoteric space. But even such a simple question is very difficult to answer. And then, actually, of course, at the time that I, you know, I was a child, <laughs> so I don't know what happened exactly, but uh, I just ran the literature. But uh, apparently, the people, uh, many people believe that uh, you know the you know the gamma bursts that come from the galactic uh, events, because uh, it's more kind of conservative. <coughs> just, just don't put your phone here, otherwise you cover it. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's uh, conservative uh, because uh, if you put the gamma ray burst, if you assume that gamma ray burst happen in the exoplanet space, then distance, you know, of course, the distance is far, right? And you need a huge analytics. So, the, for example, the typical gamma ray burst flu flux is 10 to the minus, you know, the uh, seven, or you know, the you know, 10 to the minus five electron per cent square per second, or per two ten to the minus seven electron per cent square per second, or something like that. So, that if you assume the distance, uh, which the cosmological distance, and then luminosity of the, this event 10 to the 52 electron per second. So, that in this case, uh, you know, the, there's a simple argument. So that because we see gamma rays, right? MAB or you know, the GB gamma rays. And then you know, once the gamma ray energy exceeds uh, you know, the electron mass energy, so that actually you should expect that the pair annihilation, so the pair production, sorry. So the gamma gamma, so the, oh, what? Gamma gamma, and then this process, right? So the you know, two photons annihilate each other, and um, uh, electrons and the protons are produced. So that you can ask that, okay, so the kind of, later we can estimate this kind of optical depth. And then you can estimate, uh, you know, the weather, uh, you can examine the way that these gamma rays can escape or not. And then uh, it turns to be the optical depth is huge. So 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 or something like that. So this implies that, you know, just gamma rays, you know, the kind of the, you know, produce the pairs. And eventually, of course, the pairs actually the annihilate. And then you expect that, you know, the ga you know, you should expect that gamma ray spectrum is completely summer. However, what they observed is different. It's actually clearly non-summer signature. So it's contradict, right? And then this is a kind of problem, you know, so-called compactness problem. And then, yes. Debate was there. Then later, the, you know, the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory was launched, and uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, detectors uh, on the Compton uh, Gamma, Ray Observatory, Gamma Ray Observatory was a so-called Bachi. And the Bachi is uh, you know the, uh, uh, can detect the gamma rays in the MEB band. So that then you know they you know the Bachi start to detect a lot of the gamma ray bursts. Okay, so the rate of the gamma ray burst is about one per day or something like that. And then this is a kind of example of the light curves. And you see that, you know, the, okay, sometimes, you know, some gamma ray bursts have the very spikes, many spikes. Some of the gamma ray bursts, uh, you know, the relatively, has a relatively smooth uh, pulse profile. And then, you know, there, there's a variety, right? 
And then, because of, uh, Batsy detected so many gamma reversed, and then they can uh, uh, take statistics. So that, uh, it turns out that so gamma reverse uh, has a two dis uh, bimodal dispersion in the duration. So the, this is what I explain, uh, what I mentioned before. Basically, the, you know, there are the two categories. One is so-called short gamma reverse. So that if the duration is less than two, shorter than two seconds, the other uh, class is a long gamma reverse when the duration is longer than two seconds. Two populations, and then. Also, the you know the study uh, statistics you know the data suggests that you know the shorter gamma reverse shorter gamma reverse actually the harder, and the long gamma reverse softer. So this means that if you compare the uh, frags in the low energy band, the higher energy band, so the basically the shorter gamma shorter gamma reverse actually the uh, actually the more higher fluence in the higher energy band. Okay, so the spectrum is harder. And then this is a plot of the T, you know, the uh, fluence T90, the d d durations. This is simply means that uh, short GRBs, have, you know, uh, energy, you know, the energy released energy is smaller for the short GRBs. Luminosity is actually the more comparable. The flux is comparable, right? So you know, then but you know, if the duration longer, then you see the more photons. Okay. So the but it detected uh, you know the, about uh, three thousand uh, gamma bursts, and you see that distribution is more or less isotropic, right? So so this is you know then people start to guess that oh the probably this kind of prefers the extra interpretation, okay? Then you can actually make a histogram, and then uh, this is something like that. And then this is the so you know the kind of you know the plot you know so-called log n log s plot. So the here is the, this is the you know flux or in this case I plot a flux, and this is a number of events. So the, if you think about uh, 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 how can how you can understand this kind of plot, so the basically is the number of the number of bursts right is uh, probably. N is right, something like that. Then this is a source density, right? In more reality, that it's kind of late, right? This is a GRB rate. Okay. And then you can detect the you 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 know the relationship on the flux, right? If you assume the standard candle. Luminosity is kind of the same, right? If you consider typical luminosity for the source, so the kind of flux is uh, 4 pi and d square, okay? So then if you uh, define the sensitivity, right? So the something with you know, limited sensitivity, so the uh, basically this kind of gives a, you know, the uh, maximum distance, okay? So the basically D max is proportional to the LF and then square, right? And then, then basically the N is proportional to the equals D cubic, and then just L cubic and the F minus three over two, okay? Then, uh, so the, if you assume, if you consider that this is an extragatic event, so that you expect that you know the you know this log and log s distributions uh, follows uh, you know the power law with uh, minus three over two. And indeed, uh, it's more or less three over two. And uh, but you see the some uh, deviations which can be interpreted the, as a fact that the universe is actually finite. Not infinite, and then uh, you should have some uh, may experiments uh, some cosmological evolution, some softening may happen. So the, in the sense, this is uh, not kind of the, you know people are, everybody is not complete, completely convinced, but uh, you know this uh, this is supports the extragatic interpretation. 
Okay, so the breakthrough came, you know, the few years later, several years later, and eventually uh, the uh, BEPSAC, this is the Italian Netherland, uh, satellite. What happened? Okay. So the idea is that, okay, the, this kind of BEPSAC satellite has a gamma ray a monitor, gamma ray blast monitor, plus wide field X ray camera and narrow field instruments. So that when gamma ray burst happens, so the, uh, you know, the websites try to uh, find the follow up, you know, the make a follow up observation of the, this gamma ray burst. They eventually that they found the counterpart in x-rays. Okay. Then this is actually very uh, important because uh, x-rays actually has a better angular resolution, you know, you know all of the minutes. And in this case, uh, you, you, furthermore, that they can try to uh, find the host galaxy. So what you Mars Messenger and uh, March wave at that time, March wave, March wave length astronomy. Gamma rays, X-rays, and uh, of course, uh, people, you know, ground telescopes try to find the counterparts. And uh, later, the, actually, eventually, they succeeded in the of uh, discovering the uh, optical afterglow in the uh, and uh, identify the host galaxy too. And if you, once you identify the host galaxy, you can measure the redshift. And then, then people confirmed that gamma ray burst happened in exoplanet space. OK. This is a kind of the, also the important thing in that discovery of aftergrowth is, can be regarded as a success of the gamma ray burst theory. Basically, is, uh, okay, we see the X-ray uh, emissions. This is a kind of fading uh, with a power loss spectrum. So the basically, the, this is a time and this is a flux. And uh, if you draw the, this kind of stuff, the, basically, this is a t to the minus 1.5 point or something like that. Okay, power row. And then uh, this was kind of predicted from the, you know, the theory of the blast waves. Which you know the sweeps in the uh, interstellar medi medium. I, I, I will explain the you know theoretical background later. And then you know and then okay so the as I explained that you know the there are the people succeeding the measurements of the redshift. And then basically the they uh, basically the they succeed in the determining the redshift for long gamma ray burst. Okay. Furthermore, if, so good. Can I ask a question? So when you associate a gamma ray burst with a galaxy, it's just because it all, I mean, you see a gamma ray burst, you see the galaxy, and it's really on the top of each other. Uh, first, you need to pin down, that because BATS is uh, X-ray is important, yes. then you need to pin down. And then you, then you use the optical follow-ups. And then usually, they see the optical afterglow. So that then, then the optical afterglow, that they, then even the optical afterglow, that they see the, some absorption lines. Okay, so that's how you associate the stuff yeah. with yeah. the galaxy, and there is always a galaxy underneath. The later the afterglow is down, and then, then, then after that, they can see the host galaxy itself. Okay. For example, the, one of the famous uh, GRBs case, actually the first uh, optical grand telescopes found the afterglow emissions. And then a few, you know, later, I think a few years later, then HST, and then try to measure the, you know, start measure the host galaxy, and then found it, and then you know the redshift consistent with what they see, so in the optical afterglow, also showing the seeing the optical afterglow. So is it correct that sometimes they find the galaxy, the galaxies are known, and they find it only because of the gamma ray burst exploding there? Oh, sometimes yes. I think the sometimes because uh, well. It turns later, as I explained, it turns out that some of the gamma ray burst holes are kind of dwarfs, very tiny galaxies. In this case, it's very difficult to observe. <laughs> you just never know. And the gamma ray burst happens. Oh, that they found the host galaxies, and oh, this is a you know very small one. Yeah, this can happen. Okay, and then furthermore, then they found the you know supernova and uh, in the direction of the gamma ray burst. The first candidate is a 1998 PW, which is associated with a 980425 uh, gamma burst. 
And then the other famous type of the famous gamma reverse is the GRB030329, and then, uh, which is associated with supernova 2003DH, okay? And then the associated supernova is broadline type 1C supernova, and uh, which is uh, thought to be the quark, related to the quark corrupts phenomena. You know, the basically related to death of massive stars. So that this, you know, supports that, you know, the gamma reverse, long gamma reverse, are associated with the death, death of massive stars. The furthermore, Yes, so the people who discover the aftergrowth and then, and then they try to find, uh, you know, the, uh, they try to uh, look for the host galaxies. Then eventually, the, okay, uh, many samples uh, came out and then um, people recognize that host of the gamma reversed are young, actively still forming, and subluminous galaxies. So these environments also related to the a star formation, right? The, which supports that gamma ray burst come from the death of massive stars. So, uh, in the theoretical side, in the 1993, and then Stan Woodray uh, proposed that a gamma ray burst uh, uh, can come, you know, that may come from the, the collapse of the massive star with fast rotation. So, the basically, the Easter, you know, the uh, massive star is fast rotating, and the collapse and the black hole is formed, right? And then, but you know, material is also the, you know, fast rotating, the accretes on the black hole, and then eventually, the, in some way, the energy is extracted from the black hole, or you know, the gravitational energy is extracted by jet, and then uh, the long gamma ray burst, uh, you know, the, uh, attributed uh, emission from the, this relativistic jet. This is a kind of collapse scenario, the basically the observations are, you know, basically associ supernova associations on the host galaxies informations suppose uh, this corrupts scenario. At least the uh, long gamma bursts are related to this of massive stars. Okay, then uh, 2004, and a Swift satellite was launched. Now the name is the Neil Gary Swift Observatory. And uh, this is actually the uh, strategy is uh, kind of the, you know, kind of similar. But uh, the important thing is that Swift can make a follow-up observation is very quickly, automatically. So when gamma ray burst happens, and they can through in the 20 to 70 seconds, very quick. And then, and then they can f try to find the X-ray counterparts or the, uh, and the optical counterparts. And indeed, at the most of the gamma ray bursts, more than 95% of the gamma ray bursts have the X-ray counterpart because they can quickly through. And if about 50% of the GRBs also, you know, have the optical counterparts. So the, thanks to the Swift Observatory, then one of the big uh, progress is that you know, the Swift Observatory uh, you know, succeeded in the identifying the Host galaxy of the short gamma burst. So the the left one, this panel shows the kind of the first X-ray afterglow, which was found in the elliptic galaxy. So the, actually, the first X-ray afterglow was uh, associated with the uh, elliptical galaxies, which is the old type galaxies, not star forming. And then later, the people try, you know, succeeded in the finding in the optical afterglows and the radio aftergrowth. So, it's a, this is actually consistent with the progenitors in the older population. Because this is the kind of, you know, the, uh, uh, the population of the short gamma, host galaxy of the short gamma reverse. And then, yes, so the, some of the short gamma reverse in helping the early type galaxies, such as the galaxies, uh, sorry, so, sorry, the late type galaxies, sorry, late type galaxies and the uh, other type galaxies, and some of the, you know, the, you know, the shorter gamma ray bursts happen in the, uh, the host rest uh, environment. And then basically the, you know, basically the, you know, shorter gamma ray bursts ha can happen in the uh, elliptal, elliptal galaxies or star-forming galaxies in both environments. 
So that this, this is actually the important thing. Not only the old galaxies, but also star home galaxies. This is the diversity. Then this is actually the consistent with that, you know, the uh, short gamma ray bursts are maybe produced by the coalescence of the uh, neutron stars or neutron star black holes, whatever. The another thing is that, you know, this is a, a distribution of the offset. Then in principle, you can try to uh, uh, measure the distance of the short GRB from the, uh, the center of the galaxy, right? And then somehow, the sh short GRBs are often uh, found in the outside the host galaxy, okay? So if you see the this plot, right? Long GRB is actually the, it's more, you know, the happen in the, you know, the center. And short gamma ray bursts happen in the, you know, can happen in the outside the galaxies. So this can be, Explain if the you know the neutral stars are subject to the kicks. So if you have you know the kicks, and then you know the binary can get out. And also the, another supporting evidence is uh, the star formation and metallicities. And then if you look at uh, here, and this is the luminosity in the blue band, and this is the star formation, right? And then you see that long gamma ray bursts, which are you know, circles, uh, actually is, uh, happen in the star homing environments. But uh, you know, short GRB is actually the, you know, actually the more traces of field galaxies. Can happen in the relatively non-star homing region. And then if you look at this plot, that uh, this is a meta resty, and this is a, you know, the beaver and the magnitude, and again, and the long GRBs happen, may happen favor the low metallicity regions, although some of the, them can happen in the high metallicity region. But at least the short GRB is actually the more or less uh, trace, uh, uh, trace uh, you know, field galaxies. This is, again, the consistent with the uh, expectation of the uh, uh, binary scenario. So, uh, in, these observations already support that short gamma ray bursts are some, you know, related to the coalescence of the neutron stars. Actually, this scenario is already predicted in the late 80s and the beginning of the 90s. And then Fermi gamma ray telescope was launched in 2008. And uh, yes, in this case, uh, uh, Fermi satellite has a GBM. This is a gamma ray. Uh, Bus monitor and then, gamma, and then this covers the 10 kb to 30 mab uh, with a field of view of the four past regions almost. And then in addition to the GBM, they, this is a uh, main part of the, you know, the detector, uh, the, this LAT, and then this can uh, detect the higher energy photons and then ranging from the 20 mab to the 300 GeV. And then, yes, GBM can detect the GRBs a lot in about 300 GRBs per year. And then detection rate in the lot uh, is much, much less. But Im important thing is that they can uh, see the gamma ray burst at very, very high energies. So thanks to the Fermi satellite, and uh, you know, now uh, we had a wide energy spectrum, OK? So the initially the people you know see the kind of the uh, you know uh, just this component, the kind of two uh, double uh, broken power roll component, but in addition to the this uh, double power roll component, they had uh, some extra component. So the, basically the one of the main mess, you know the uh, result is that you know the uh, we we know that the gamma ray burst have a spectrum which is more complicated than we thought. And then this is a you know, hard component, then which is observed in the both long gamma ray burst and the short gamma ray burst. And then, then as you see that this is the time sequence, and the hard, you know, the hard component of the gamma rays is comes later. We have scenarios, but uh, still under debate. And uh, we have uh, good scenarios, but uh, we have not confirmed it. I explained their interpretation right there. But when you say hard, uh, um, there must be at least some elementary physics consideration that 
Yes, I think the best interpretation is inverse Compton emission. And then just, you know, the prompt photons are upscattered by the, you know, the internal shock regions or reverse shock regions. That this can explain the you know, spectrum and the offset. And Oh uh, yeah, part acceleration part we don't know. Correct. So the, in this case, but uh, at least, but we on, indeed measured this gamma rays. At least the particles have to be accelerated uh, some energies. And uh, actually, the, we at least we know that uh, these are pro related to the prompt emissions because we see the clear correlation between the this GB emissions and the MEB gamma rays. So that you know, at least observationally, we need the connections and then. And radiation mechanism, yes. So the inverse Compton, the, some people talk about hadronic mechanism, but we don't know. And the particle acceleration mechanism is actually more under debate. It's more complicated. The, the theory part, I will explain that probably later. I will revisit it later. And then even more, and then they found a funny thermal component. And then in the Emmy band, actually the, you know, various kinds of bump, uh, they found a bumpy spectrum so in some cases. And then uh, this component, uh, you know, interpreted as uh, some summer component, modified black body. And then now that people, at least uh, we think that uh, prompt emission spectrum uh, consists of three components. The first is the broken power component, so it's called band component. And the plus sometimes we see the power component. And then the plus uh, we see the some summer component. We don't understand, correct. No, the uh, definition. Oh, definition. Oh, okay, sorry. So the, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So the band component is, uh, you know, the basically the power of double power of smooth, smoothly connected the double, uh, you know, broken power, broken power. So, you know, two power rows there, that you can smoothly connect the two power row. Basically, smoothed, uh, smoothly connected broken power row. This is the band function. Band is the name of the. Uh, you know. well, I might think that this is a phenomenal fit, empirical fit. Is the band? This is a name. <laughs> okay. Then, furthermore, then not only prompt emission, but also the long lasting high energy emission was also found. Basically, in some GRVs, okay, the lat gamma ray, lat detected gamma rays, but they, the emission lasts for the more than 10 seconds and 100 seconds. So they continue. So probably this is more related to afterglow emissions, which was already, already seen in X-rays and the radius. Then, finally, and the latest development is the discovery of the GW170817, which is associated with a short gamma ray burst. And then, as I said, you know, the, you know, also, you know, the uh, Fermi satellite detects a short gamma ray pass with a duration of the two seconds. And then uh, associated gravitational wave event. And later, the, you know, the, uh, a lot of measurements in the, you know, have been well done in the X-rays, UV, optical, and infrared, and radio band. And they found counterparts. So uh, this is the, you know, the location. So the Fermi detected gamma ray burst, but the GBM does not have a good angular resolution, so that you have a bigger error burst. The LIGO, BAGO, and then you have also the, you know, the uh, errors in the sky locations. And eventually, the, you know, the you know, optical, because they found the optical counterpart, right? And then they were able to identify the uh, associated host galaxy, which is turned to be the, you know, the uh, NC4993. And then uh, basically the, you know, then they kind of, the, you know, they can, uh, they found, uh, you know, the uh, host galaxy too, and then they can determine the distance, because this is the distance to the host galaxies, and which is consistent with the distance estimated from the gravitational wave observations only. And then this is the characteristics of the, this short GRBs, and uh, yes, so that this is, uh, again, the distribution of the duration, this is a short GRB, and this is a long GRB bump, 
And then you see that you know, the duration is about two seconds, which is uh, more consistent with uh, Shoji RB. And the uh, spectral hardness is also more or less consistent with the Shoji RB. However, and, uh, we do not understand the mechanism of the gamma rays for this guy. Then, roughly speaking, there are two interpretations. So the one is that, you know, the, okay, so the, at least the, we know that uh, from the gravitational wave observations, and uh, as uh, I will explain later, the other afterglow observations, we know that this GRB was observed in the off axis. Basically, the jet uh, actually is uh, not uh, point to Earth, do not point to Earth. We see the, this event off axis. Then some people think that, okay, so gamma ray emission is quite bright. In the, if, you are, if you are in the all axis, but if, because we see the off axis emissions, the gamma ray emission is very weak. Because of this gamma ray emission is very tiny, you know, the total energy of gamma ray is, is quite small compared to the typical gamma ray burst. And then another interpretation is that, okay, the, there's a, some another mechanism, it's actually so called, uh, you know, the maybe shock breakout emissions, which we will explain the probably uh, tomorrow but not from jet. So there's some jet-induced uh, you know, shock, and then you know, when the shock gets out from the ejector, we see the gamma rays. This is another interpretation. Then there are two, there are two interpretations which are under debate, and we, don't, uh, we are, do not agree on the interpretation of these gamma rays. However, no matter what the origin of the gamma ray is, <laughs> We are sure that uh, 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 we should sure that we have a jet. Then, uh, yes. And, uh, Can you explain how a jet forms? Uh, yes, later. Because I try to, you know, give the history overview first. And then this is uh, because because uh, we see the aftergrowth, and uh, this is consistent with uh, you know the picture of jet. Okay, so the this is the final our uh, recent reviews. Yes, so the Fermi detected gamma rays and the Cherenkov telescopes and the grand telescopes, including MAGIC and HES, Veritas, which are good at uh, observing higher energy gamma rays for, let's say, the, you know, the 10 GeV or even TV energies. In principle, you can observe the gamma ray burst, right? But the only issue is that, you know, you have to make a follow-up observation very quickly, right? Because gamma ray bursts are very short time transient. And then uh, people wanted to detect they tried, failed many for many years, and then, but just recently the, they succeeded. <laughs> this is the very latest news, and uh, probably the uh, most spectacular one is actually the latest GRB, uh, the 1901-14C, and then basically the you know initial analysis already indicated that gamma, you know, this already de detected uh, one of the brightest GRBs, and then, and then. Initial analysis, you know, that suggested that more than 20 sigma. The follow-up analysis is more than 50 sigma. So they detect a lot of photons. So the results not, have not come out yet. So probably we will see papers in a couple of months. I, I don't know when. And then, so also the magic has some indication of the gamma rays, TB, 100 GB gamma rays from the short GRB, and this is three sigma detection which was reported uh, several years ago, which is not, uh, you know, this is tentative, but still interesting because this is short GRB. And uh, furthermore, HES also reported that, you know, the discovery of the high, very high energy gamma ray associated with the gamma ray burst. This is also, you know, the, I think the, according to the presentation of the ICRC, that they claim that this is five sigma. Okay, so this is the latest news, and then uh, we will see papers in uh, probably in soon, and then let's see what's going on. Okay, so this is a historical overview. Now the, let's uh, move on on the you know the theoretical uh, interpretation. So this is a kind of picture of the big picture of gamma ray burst. So the, in the case of long gamma ray bursts, especially the people believe that they, you know, the, they come from the uh, crops of the jet, uh, the crops, uh, mass, uh, crop, gravitation crops are massive stars, and then we might have black hole or neutron stars, and they have jets, and, uh, which is relativistic. 
And then first, uh, we see the prompt emissions. Because uh, as I said, the first, you know, the, we see the gamma emissions in the MEV range. And then people believe that uh, these MEV gamma rays come from the somewhere in the internal regions. And that, you know, probably I will explain the internal shock later. The later, the, you know, the, this, after the internal dissipation happens, which is the response for the gamma ray burst, and we have afterglow emissions, and which is long lasting, you know, which can continue for more than hours and day or months sometimes. So what is the central engine? So unfortunately, that this is a kind of the most mysterious thing. Then we don't know the, what exactly happens. But as I said, you know, in the case of longer gamma bursts, uh, people believe that you know the, this is related, uh, you know, the massive stirs. And uh, in the case of short JRB, is uh, more related to the coalescence of neutron stirs or neutron star black holes. Now, in any case, in either case, and then the, there are two uh, uh, scenarios. One scenario is that when the massive stirs actually collapses, and then basically the you know the inner inner part becomes black hole because the you know the stellar mass is so big, and then you know uh, before the you know uh, just you know promptly crops the black hole, and then later the surrounding materials accretes onto the black hole, and then because the density is so high, right? In the between the black hole, the density is so high, and also that you expect that the magnetic fields, strong magnetic fields. And then, because the neutron, you know, the density is so high, that you can expect that the neutrinos, a lot of neutrinos are emitted, and the neutrino neutrino annihilation happens, electron-positron pairs are produced, and you can have uh, some, you know, the hot plasma. This is one of the, you know, the possibility to have uh, outflows. Or alternative scenario is that you know because the magnetic fields are amplified in the disk, and then these magnetic fields are actually the attached the black hole. And of course, uh, you know, the fast rotating, the black hole should also have spin, fast rotating. And then uh, if the magnetic field actually the attached the black hole, and uh, you can extract the rotation energy black hole, which is so-called the round hole dynamic mechanism. And then, uh, or another possibility is that, you know, the, when the uh, crops happens, instead of the black hole, the very, very highly strongly magnetized neutron star may be formed, so-called magnetar, which is a, has a magnetic field of the 10 to the 15 gas, crazy, and also super fast rotating, millisecond. Millisecond, few times 10 to 15 gas, crazy neutron stars formed, and of course, if you, once you put the, this kind of the, uh, crazy stars, and then, uh, you know, because of, you know, the, the, the lot of energy losses, and the magnetic centric force, and then basically the energy, rotation energy of the neutron star can be extracted. So the, there are several possibilities, and the, which are uh, thought to be responsible for the uh, engine of the gamma ray burst. So, but we don't know the exact details of the, you know, the formation of the jet. And then, uh, the second problem is that once jet is formed, then in the case of a long gamma ray burst, we know that jet is surrounded with star. So the, you, at least jet have to get out from the star, right? And then this is a kind of the important requirement that we call successful jet. And then this is actually not trivial. This problem is not trivial at all. Because if jet is powerful, a, you may expect that jet can get out. But if jet is not powerful, or duration is uh, kind of short, if your density is so high, basically jet kind of fails. <laughs> then you can have a kind of choke jet. And then instead of the having a gamma ray burst, you might have just supernova. <laughs> so, but this problem is actually that you can uh, address. And then we understand what's going on, at least for the, you know, the uh, people do the simulations for the hydrodynamic jet and the MHU jet. Basically, the, what happened in the hydrodynamic jet is that, uh, you know, basically this kind of the physics is controlled by the luminosity, duration, and jet opening angle, and the density profile. 
So the once when the jet is actually the uh, penetrating, the, when jet is uh, are going through the stir, uh, you know we have a you know a, the kind of the uh, we have shock, right? Because of jet uh, stir surface, uh, jet stir interaction, you have a shock, and you have a kind of a cocoon because are, you know a lot of the hot material is produced by shock, and then you have a kind of the uh, you know the cocoon. And the cocoon has, uh, because the uh, temperature is high, right? And then basically the cocoon try to, uh, you know, the push the jet from the side. And then you have a run pressure balance in the jet head, and you have, uh, you know, cocoon pressures, and then try to uh, collimate uh, the jet itself. So they, as a result, uh, people find that when the, even if you start from the conical jet with some jet opening angle, because of the presence of the cocoon pressure, because, because you know, jet itself, the jet, jet stellar interaction forms a very hot material, and then this kind of cocoon try to collimate the jet, and the jet becomes eventually cylindrical, and it helps the jet to get through the stir. And then, then after the you know, collimations, then basically, even no matter what the jet Lorentz factor is, you know, the Lorentz factor of the jet becomes uh, jet slow down. The Lorentz factor is actually the, you know, satisfies some causal relationship. And then basically, the uh, Lorentz factor becomes one over theta j. And then Lorentz factor is the order of hue. And then after jet gets out from the star, then because uh, this jet is very hot, right? Jet is hot. And then after jet gets a star, then basically that this, you know, uh, you can expect a further acceleration from the jet, of the jet, because of adiabatic expansion. So uh, this is a kind of uh, picture uh, we have, and then the, we have the classical fire border. So basically, the, this is kind of schematic pictures. So initially, the, okay, we don't know the, you know, what, how the jet is formed, but somehow the, you know, the uh, jet is accelerated to the relative speed. So the, in the case of the, you know, if the jet is dominated by radiation in the beginning, basically because radiation, as a, as a jet expands, so basically the radiation energy is converted to the kinetic energy, and the Lorentz factor is increased, and then this is proportional to the radius. Then, but I have to say that this part depends on the details of the physics. So if I assume that radiation dominated the case, then you expect this. But if you assume that jet is, is dominated by magnetic fields, you could expect a different scaling. Can be R or can be something with a smaller power. This part is actually de 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 depends on the details. But, in, then, but jet is eventually accelerated to the sum of our, our Lorentz factor. And then eventually, the, you know, the, it has a saturated, that is a costing radius. And then jet has a, some finite Lorentz factor, and then eventually you expect that you know the if the jet has a you know the inhomogeneity in the inside, you can have the internal shocks. Mm -hmm. so what you call the jet are the particles from kind of the cone or what? Oh, the it's collimated flow. So the, actually, the can be cone or can be cylindrical. We call both jets. Yeah, yeah. So the collimated, you know, in case, case, like, you know, there's some more, you know, even in the conical flow, it's a, you know, uh, it has a beaming angle, right? Okay. So if I understand correctly, what you call the Lorentz factor of the jet is the Lorentz factor of the collimated particles. And that increases because at the beginning it just believes the uh, photons with the relativistic energy here. Yes. And that's fixed. It doesn't change. And by the time it's just the particle, and therefore the gamma factor grows of the particle? Oh, no, so first, let's consider initially the radiation only dominated the fireball. It's a, you know, just radiation only. So the fireball is a ball or is it the jet? Is it's it actually jet. It's um, <laughs> terminology that we call fireball, but uh, this is a classical final. But in, in, actually, the, I would say that this is a jet. People believe that this is a jet. So it's in the cone. It's cone. Then, but the radiation rich environment, then eventually is a, this internal energy, right? And then, then radiation energy is converted to kinetic energy as a, when the, the flow expands. Okay. And then, then basically the, uh, you, the kinetic energy increases as a adiabatic expansion. But, so you're assuming that the energy density is just deposited at the beginning or there is a source for a certain time? 
Uh, energy is fixed, right? Uh, yeah, total energy, total energy fixes, and then it's converted. And then, then as long as the system is optically thick, of course, uh, if once the system is optically thin, the story is different. As long as the system is optically thick, then you have adiabatic expansion. Then it's kind of that you have a gamma ray Lorentz factor is cost and then uh, costing, and then you have eventually the jet start to interact with the external material. So this is the classical pictures, okay. Okay, so one thing, I stop here uh, before the, we start to discuss the uh, details of prompt emissions, because uh, one of the complications in the gamma ray burst is uh, uh, we have to talk about uh, different time scales. So basically, this is a special relativity problem. So the basically, the, we have two frames and three time scales. So the one frame is that, okay, we have a you know, frame which is attached to the engine, okay? But we have jet, right? We have jet. Then, because the jet is relativistic, then you can actually uh, think about a frame which is attached to the jet, kind of co-moving frame, right? Co-moving frame, okay? There are two frames. And time scale is actually that you always find three times, which is kind of sometimes very confusing. So first thing is that, okay, uh, it's a, like a, a, you can, you know, you can put a clock in the frame, right? And then the central engine rest of frame, and then you can measure the time. Uh, this is a kind of the uh, time frame, time scale, which is attached to the engine, okay? Kind of universal time. And then it, but, you know, the, you can also have the co-moving time scale because the jet is moving, and you can also define the time scale, and which is defined in the, uh, you know, move, you know, the co -move, uh, frame which is co-moving with jet. Okay, this is different, right? It's a moving frame. The third time frame is that it's like a redshift. So the observer, you can, okay, if you have a, a observer time, basically let's think about, uh, you know, the photon is emitted T1 in the central engine frame, and T2 hat in the central, frame, central engine frame. And then this time difference, T2 minus T, T1, T2 minus T2 hat minus T1 hat, is different from the time interval measured in the observed frame, right? And then basically this is the time dilation effect. And uh, sorry, this is a kind of propagation effect, sorry. This is a propagation effect. And then, uh, as you already find in the, you know, the uh, special relativity problem. And then basically you have to dis discriminate the two frames and the three time scales. So roughly speaking, so that this T, this just usual T, this is the observer time frame, okay? Uh. Observer time. Okay, then this T hat is a engine frame. So the the frame which is attached to the kind of rest of frame of the central engine star. Okay. And then so for simply the I know the redshift. You know the you know in reality you have to take into account the redshift furthermore. So the but in the limits that we can ignore redshift that we consider these three time scales. The mu is basically the cosine theta, right? So, okay, so the, because of, if you think about, uh, you know, the, this is a jet, okay? If it, this is a jet, then let's think about this, you know, the flow is moving with uh, this velocity beta. And then this pulse is emitted T1. Basically, d, dt, dt hat is a T2 hat minus T1 minus, and DT is basically the T2 minus T1, right? So this time difference in the observer frame is basically the, uh, described by the, this uh, path difference, right? This is a projection, okay? One minus beta cosine and DT hat is okay? And then, be, then because uh, you are thinking that you know the uh, almost you know the jet is is pointing toward Earth, right? 
So the u is, mu is almost one. So basically the here, what happens is that one minus beta, and then you can multiply the one plus beta, and the one minus, then this is gamma square, gamma square, and then one plus beta is two. So this is what, what happened. It's clear? So that because the mu is actually the almost unity, because the jet is when the jet is pointing toward us. So that you have a relationship, roughly speaking. So the DT observe the, ob, this central engine time is related to the observed time with gamma square. So that this gamma square part is important, okay? So this implies that if you measure the time scale, time one pulse, so with a duration of one second, and then if the Lorentz factor is 100, so that in the central engine frame, the corresponding time difference is 10 to the four seconds. It's different, okay? Because the jet is a you know, relative scale effect, special relativity. So you can ask the kind of co-moving time scale, because, uh, because if you think of a jet is moving, right? This jet is moving. This is jet, and then you can you can um, in this case I, you know this is a kind of simple just time dilation right. This is a you know the engine frame, and then this is a co-moving frame. So the in the you know if you consider a proper time in the which it attaches the co-moving frame, if you measure the lifetime of this part, you know, particle with a, you know some proper lifetime of the tau in the observer frame. Uh, sorry, the lava frame, and then you can expect that you know the duration is uh, lifetime is dilated to the longer by factor of the gamma, right? The same thing. So here is uh, basically dt hat is gamma dt, right? This is the time dilation. It's simple then because we know that you know the this is another important consequence because the t t hat is is t over gamma square. So this implies that dt is dt hat gamma. And then if you substitute here, um, sorry, this is a, sorry, this is something wrong. <laughs> Typo. dt, dt hat. So they, then you can, you can expect a two gamma and the d, dt. Okay? Is okay? So basically the co-moving time is time scale is longer by factor of gamma compared to the observed time. So when you translate, this is important if you want to calculate the emissions. Because uh, in the co-moving frame is actually the plasma rest frame. So when you want to calculate the particle acceleration or you know, the radiations, usually people work in the co-moving frame of the jet. Right? But you need to translate the observed time scale to the co-moving frame. And you work on this, and you can do the kind of the estimate, or you can calculate. And then, then when you want to compare the results with the observations, you can basically the, you know, uh, perform the transform the run, you know, perform the run transformation again. So these two, always you need to keep in mind there are three time scales and then uh, with two frames. Okay, keeping this in mind, okay, so that then, you know, uh, I think that I will uh, briefly uh, just this is a kind of overview again. So the basic picture of the classical uh, picture of the gamma burst is that, okay, the so first we have a gamma burst, the engine, the Lorentz factor, jet is accelerated with the Lorentz factor, the Lorentz factor of 100, so 300, 1,000. Then, oh, movie doesn't work, sorry. So the, when the jet has inhomogeneity and these two jets in a collide with each other, then we have an internal shocks. That when you have shocks, that you can dissipate the part of the bulk kinetic energy and the field shock dissipation, and the part of the energy can be used for the particle acceleration, magnetic fields, and heat, 
and the particle, you know, the electrons lose the energy, and then the first, you know, internal dispersion is um, interpreted as a prompt emission. Then later, the many, many shocks happen and they collide each other, and then you have a, you know, the uh, kind of, you know, a big jet, and then the, after the, you know, the many collisions, the jet start to sweep the uh, interstellar material. This is, this is so-called external shock, because jet interacts with the external material, medium. And again, same business. The shock, the particles are accelerated and radiate synchrotron emissions, and which is supposed to be the afterglow emission. This is the standard picture of the gamma ray burst. Okay, so first, I would like to talk about the prompt emissions. So prompt emissions, again, the, it's actually the classical picture is, uh, you know, the broken power spectrum. So the, this is a band functions, smooth, uh, smoothly connected band uh, power. So this is a, you know, uh, beta is a photon index. Then F nu is uh, basically the photons are per, you know, the area per time. So that if you multiply the frequency nu, this is nu F nu, this is the energy flux. So the basically this, if you look at this spectrum, basically this implies that most of the energies uh, come from the MAB, located the MAB range, okay? The you have broken power O, spectrum is actually rising with the index one, and then more or less uh, declining or something flat. And then in the standard internal shock scenario, it's a classical scenario, people uh, believe that uh, this uh, MEB gamma ray emission is, comes from the synchrotron emission. So as I explained before, so the internal shocks, the electrons are accelerated and by shock, and then these accelerated electrons radiate the synchrotron photons. And then, as I've already, uh, Pascual already talked about this uh, synchrotron emission form, right? This is the, you know, the uh, synchrotron energy, right? And then, the, but you need to multiply the gamma because uh, this is a co-moving. This is a co-moving. In that, you know, the synchrotron energy, photon energy in attached to the jet frame but the jet is uh, moving toward the Earth, then you need to take into account the gamma. And then if you plug in this number, so that if you assume that the Lorentz factor is 100 or something like that, and then Lorentz, you know, sorry, the Lorentz factor is 300, and the electron Lorentz factor is also 100, something like that, then magnetic fields actually is a, you know, are, if the magnetic fields are around 10 to 4 to 10 to 5 Gauss, then you can, think that you know this emission is come, may come from a synchrotron you know emission but as i said you know the lorentz factor 300 there's some reason but the electron lorentz factor is kind of the just i gave the by hand right it's a you know there's a kind of the already number is kind of phenomenological and the observationally the, we also have uh, interesting correlations and uh, some of the correlations are still under debate, but uh, uh, there's a, some, apparently the, there seems a relationship between the energy, peak energy of, and uh, uh, total gamma ray energy. So the, this E peak is here, this energy, okay? This is a peak energy. So the, this part is a peak of the spectrum. And E iso is a basically the total energy of the released as gamma rays. Uh, in the case of gamma ray bursts, I would say tens of 53 erg in the, in the, you know, kind of apparently observed energy. Basically what I say is that E iso is that you see the flux and the duration, duration and the distance square, okay? It's a simple, this is a flux and this duration, and just you, you, if you multiply the four by d square, then you can actually the, you know, have the total energy released as gamma rays. Don't you have to make an assumption about the open No, this is, the, that's a little, yes. So the, this is the isotropic equilibrium. This means that I, it's a obs, apparent, because we, 
jet opening angle, it's very difficult to estimate. That, that this, in this sense, uh, E ISO can be determined by observation itself. That's why we use this. So that this is a E ISO. Then this E jet is actually the collection of the jet opening angle. So that what I mean is that you know that this energy, <laughs> this is a, uh, you know always uh, confusing. Basically, the here is the observer, the gamma is ob here. Isotropic equivalent energy is that if you assume that this gamma is actually the emitted everywhere, it's apparent. And then you can calculate the total energy of the gamma rays. This is isotropic equivalent. But of course, in reality, as I explained probably tomorrow, the true energy is actually the come from the very collimated region. So true energy is actually that should be much, much smaller. And then this EGA is actually the true energy. It's a you know, jet energy after the collection of the jet opening angle. But of course, uh, this has to be determined by another way. And then this is actually, we need to use the information the other after growth. Then I, you know, I will discuss later because another physics comes in. Peak is, a, yeah, just the observation. We see the empirical you know, data. Then we have, a, we can measure spectrum. The peak energy is just determined by the most, you know, the spectral peak here. Yes, yes. Uh, this is actually, I'm going to discuss later, so because this is a pr famous problem. And the next slide is actually talking about this, actually. And then another relationship is that your network relationship, and basically the data relationship, luminosity and peak energy, the same thing. There's a kind of empirical relationship. And then, because this is a kind of the, uh, useful, because if you have a good theory, you expect that you can explain this, right? Then again, so the, as Pasquale suggested, that this is a famous problem, notorious problem, and then this is an issue in the synchrotron energy uh, spectrum. This is a so-called low energy index problem. Uh, spectrum index you measure is typically one here. And sometimes we see the spectrum is harder than, you know, Sometimes we see the two in the very hard spectrum. But the synchrotron theory, and actually the, in this case, uh, our internal, internal, synchrotron spec, internal shock synchrotron scenario, typically the theory predicts that uh, much softer spectrum new to the one half. So observable spectrum is typically much a bit harder than the uh, spectrum simple theory predicted. So this implies that if you want to explain the prompt emission spectrum and then the synchrotron theory, you have to play a game. Then still under debate, and then just you know, I just to uh, explain. Uh, mentioned uh, several possibilities. So one possibility is uh, it's a kind of complicated case. So the electron cooling, you only consider the synchrotron cooling, but electron cooling is you know, the, you know, not only synchrotron cooling, but also inverse Compton cooling is important, but the Kryonishina effect has to be important. Then you can change the shape. But uh, you know, this is the one of the uh, possibilities and the second possibility is that you know the people actually talk about uh, uh, intermediate regime between the fast throw. So basically, the electrons are very you know fast cooling means that you know the electrons are very quickly uh, cooled uh, within that uh, dynamical time scale. And when the, before the shock is actually uh, the cross is a uh, uh, flow, basically the electron cools very rapidly. But you can think about the electrons are not so cooled, super fast, but you know, moderately cooled. It's a kind of fine-tuned situation. And then people talk about this kind of stuff. This is a, a problem, so that we don't have a good answer. 
So the synchrotron model has uh, several uh, other issues. So the, apparently, the, some of the gamma bursts have a very high radiation efficiency. So the uh, typically internal shocks, so that you, if you, if you have in, you know, internal dispersion, so you expect the part of the kinetic energy is dissipated as a prompt emission. Then rest of the energies and then goes to the afterglow. Okay? But uh, sometimes we observe the prompt emissions is actually the quite efficient. And then it's not so clear how you can explain the, why the prompt emission is so efficient in the standard scenario. And then again, the second, uh, the second problem is that, as I said, the spectral relations is to how not, it's not clear how we can explain the spectral relations. And the third you know, issue is the theoretical issues. And then this is the probably, I'm not sure the Pasquale will talk about this. I don't know, relativistic shock acceleration, I don't know. So the, you know, the, it's a several issue in the acceleration of the electrons and relativistic shocks. So then it, because of the, these problems, actually the recent, you know, the 10 years, people actually uh, try to think about the alternative possibilities, you know, other than synchrotron emissions. So I, I think the, I will finish, you know, so the, it's okay. If we finish the, in the one or two slides, then the, uh, so the one thing that, you know, uh, it's a kind of the possibility people, one of the possibility that people talk about is that, you know, the uh, stochastic acceleration, the MHD turbulence, and basically the when, even when we have a shocks, so the, after you have a shocks, uh, basically downstream is actually the quite turbulent. And then in the turbulent medium, it's actually the, it's possible to expect uh, some stochastic acceleration that was even heating, just heating might be enough. And then just, you know, the, once you have a heating from the turbulence, then you can expect that situation where the electrons are heated or reaccelerated, and on the other hand, electrons are cooled via synchrotron emissions. Then basically peak energy can be determined by the balance between the heating and the cooling. And this is so-called the stroke heating scenario. And then in, in this case, in principle, you can uh, explain the band functions and, uh, because, uh, you know, because the cooling and heating, actually the spectrum is modified. Of the, then you can, it's possible to have a kind of hard spectrum. And then if you put the change the parameters, you can also and explain the, you know, this kind of hard component. Uh, this is uh, one of the possibilities, and uh, people will actually discuss. And the second possibility is that, you know, the, okay, we talk about the internal shocks, but let's forget it. So the, not forget it. The, we shouldn't forget it, but uh, we can modify the physics, but we can also expect the magnetic dissipations, which may be related to the internal shocks or may not. So the, because, you know, the, as I said, the, we don't understand the jet composition. The jet is actually the, quite natural to expect that jet is quite magnetized. And then it's possible to convert the magnetic energy into the particle energy. So this is a, this magnetic dispersion scenario, which is a one, you know, also quite popular. And then people discuss, uh, you know, the, basically the people discuss the connections. Then again, in this case, the reconnection, how reconnections happen is actually the, under debate. So the one of the possibilities that reconnection is a kind of, a, you know, the triggered by the internal shocks. And the other possibility that the reconnection happens in the just, you know, the, you know, the striped winds. But in this case, in the case, actually, the, uh, in principle, this kind of efficient mechanism can be efficient and it can be expected for the magnetic dominated jet. However, uh, unfortunately, the, we don't understand the details, and then just the people show that it's possible to sh explain the spectrum uh, by phenomenal scale model. Basically, the, if you put the jet, which is actually the, you know, assumes the magnetic dissipation, then the varying some magnetic fields, and then in, in principle, the, you can try to you can explain the band functions is, uh, you know, the varying magnetic fields, uh, which uh, also the electrons are ac accelerated by the reconnections or magnetic dispersion process and then distributed, you know, along the jet. 
So this part is actually the kind of the, you know, the very actively studied and then now, and then because uh, it's a, uh, you know, uh, people actually try to uh, summarize uh, particle acceleration spectrum in the reconnections now. So the, I think that, you know, this is a paper by the, you know, Sironia Spitokovsky, and then basically the, you know, the, he has shown the spectrum of the reconnections, then this is the magnetic parameters, which is described how the uh, magnetic fields are strong compared to the kinetic energy of the flow. And then basically, the, if the magnetic fields, are, as the magnetic fields are stronger and stronger, and the particle spectrum can be harder and harder, and then in principle, that this kind of hard spectrum may help us to explain the spectrum of the gamma ray burst, but still there are a lot of things uh, unknown. So the, in a sense, actually, the, this field is actually, uh, this kind of the studies are just people uh, uh, you know, uh, study the <coughs> spectrum and the radiations are in the very actively. Okay, so uh, I will stop here and then I think that I cannot see the time actually. Okay, yes, I think I'll stop here because I think that tomorrow and uh, I'm going to the, the rest of the uh, scenarios, the so-called photospheric scenario. And then this is a kind of the, at least uh, this kind of photospheric component is, as, actually, I, as I also explained, that the Fermi sees a kind of very bumpy spectrum in the summer component. At least for some of GRBs, this photospheric component exists. And uh, at this kind of the emission mechanism can also explain the, you know, the prompt emission spectrum, and then people actually, the, you know, the understand the, how the photospheric emission is formed, and uh, which is uh, one of the most popular explanations for the prompt emissions. Then after we discuss uh, prompt emission spectrum, then I'm going to uh, go through the afterglow theory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't know, uh, could an uncollimated jet produce a supernova uh, and still being a GRB? Uh, I mean, uh, the jet have the jet has an opening angle, right? Yes. So, can the material? Uh, be stored inside the star, and the jet could uh, still emit material. Uh, this phenomena uh, is observed. Uh, I don't know. Uh, theoretically, it could be, but observationally, uh, could it happen? Oh, you mean that if when the jet is. At least uh, you can address that whether the jet can suck, you know, get penetrate the star or not, right? And then yes, so that even if jet gets out, and then we because we don't understand how you know jet emits uh, radiations, uh, we do not completely understand what would happen. But uh, this is a kind of the at least uh, if you jet luminosity is if you know the jet power. And uh, if you know the progenitor star, star structures, what is the progenitor? For example, blue supergiant, wall fryer. And then if you know if you know the jet, if you give the jet luminosity open angle, then you can check that this jet can uh, successfully penetrate the star or not. And then at least, for example, the, by using putting the, these kind of parameters, and you can try to explain the uh, distribution of the long GRBs. Duration, distribution of the duration along with GRBs. And then also, uh, it's kind of natural to expect that you know, the sum of the jet can not penetrate the star. And indeed, uh, tomorrow, the probably I will explain that such an object apparently there. And then one, several objects, so-called uh, low luminosity gamma ray burst, uh, People think that they are kind of the related uh, 
jet which marginally fail or marginally success, marginally succeed in the get penetrating the stir. Thank you. More questions? Otherwise, there will be no coffee break. Okay, so that was. I just have a couple of questions, Kota. So, um, you know, with the uh, three times two frames calculation, the yeah. approximation that we're making, so do we not need to worry about particle acceleration, which is non inertial? Like, how well, how well an uncertainty? is there for calculating the Lorentz factor when you know that you have acceleration to worry about in the particle acceleration regime? Oh, well, of course, uh, you know, you, okay, I would say this is already simplistic. Of course. So the, it's uh, indeed uh, if you, for example, in realities, uh, we, you know, it depends on how particle acceleration occurs. And then typically, the, we have to define the plasma frame. Mm. And then, they, of course, uh, okay, the, in reality, that you have to take into account the uh, realistic angular distribution of the particles, right. and you have to transform this distribution in the real frame. But the people usually, of course, because we, in that case, uh, we don't understand the uh, details of the particle acceleration. And then for simplicity, the people just assume that in the plasma frame, particle distribution is isotropic. So I guess in the region so, where the gamma factor is constant, this approximation probably holds quite well, right? Because in this frame, we would basically have constant velocity almost or something. Well, so so yes. relativistically, it might be okay. uh, Of course, uh, if you start to think about jet structures, mm. which is not true. So that basically, the work, so if you, reality, the, what would they expect that, you know, probably the, uh, for example, mm. uh, it's a different com combination. I would say that here is a gamma is kind of the high, and then here the thrower. Oh, as a function of angle. You angle, mean, for example. Yeah. Then, you, then of course, uh, in reality, that you can also expect internal shock by definition is that the Lorentz factor has a, uh, some distribution. Yeah. So yeah. That basically, the in the larger, dura larger directions, okay, this part is gamma is uh, 300. And this part is gamma is 100. That's the reason why this fast flow catch overtakes the Lorentz factor. Too. So does that mean as well then that the composition of the jet is angular dependent? And if it's so, it's a radial dependence. So that you expect you, in reality, realistic jet, you should have the both radial dependence yeah. and angular dependence. Mm -hmm. And then when you walk in the, you know, the, if you want to calculate, uh, you know, the everything, basically the. Okay, you have to, you know the plasma co-moving frame, that you need to calculate the distribution of the particle distribution in each frame, mm. and then you convert, uh, you need to uh, perform the Lorentz transformation for the each fluid element. Yeah. And this is a... It's a very convoluted know, problem, I guess. Yeah, and then, then also, once you start to talk about the radiation processes, mm. then of course, uh, like Synchrotron emission energy. is a kind of local stuff. Mm. So that if you know the magnetic field in the you know local element, you can calculate. But the inverse Compton is not local. Right. And then basically the you know, photons actually are from here. Then basically the maybe upscattered somewhere else. So in reality, the basically you have to solve the related transfer problem. Then this is actually the very important even in the this kind of calculation. Especially the I'm going to talk about the photospheric emission tomorrow. But the realistic calculations, basically, the, you have to do the relative transfer. And then people are, important thing that uh, people now start to do the, this kind of relative transfer calculation. Because now the people who can do the simulations of the jet, then, of course, uh, you have to give the initial conditions. Then you can put the jet, and then you can uh, simulate the how the jet is evolved. And then, you know, at least for the summer part, you can calculate. No summer part, basically, it depends on the, what you assume. Can I ask one more? Yeah. Let's see. Anybody else have yeah. another question? And then otherwise I can keep. Anybody? Okay. <laughs> it's just a quick one. So um, you had a pie chart earlier on, which was looking at the um, classification of GRVs with regards to long, short, uh, hostless, and inconclusive. And it seems as if 50% of the possible GRBs are unknown. 
but there must be some tentative classification of these objects. So I was just wondering what kind of objects they might be. Oh, like, this one? They, where do they fall, roughly, in terms of, like... This host rest? Right, yeah, and the inconclusive. Host rest probably maybe just, you know, outside the galaxy, so we don't know uh, some galaxies probably... So it's really uncertainty that drives it, then? Sorry? It's really our uncertainty. Yeah, on, within uh, uncertainty. Well, yes, I think so, because it depends on the... How 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 large the kick is, right? Mm. Then sometimes that's you know the, if the complete of, offset is huge, and you sh you expect this the host rest, or simply the this galaxy is a kind of the you know hard to observe, on some reason, mm. and uh, it's a probably combination. Okay, thank you. All right, so store all the questions for Kota and the previous professor, both Pasquales, for after the coffee break. We come here for a discussion session, and the three of them will be sitting there. So you can address all the questions, write them down. Uh, right now it's coffee break. And before thanking Kota again, we will collect, we, we all get out from the lower door, and we take a picture. We have been asked to, OK? So I would like to thank Kota again. <laughs> Let's get out that way and then I'll ring the bell in 30 minutes.